Well, um, thank you enough. Um, it was a very interesting uh, session and discussion. I, I enjoyed myself. Um, and, and thank you everyone for making the time to be, to, to be together with us um, this afternoon. I know that, you know, like the, this is a timing that we are mostly thinking about like the holiday season and uh, spending time, you know, like with the family also to close in the fiscal year for the ones that, you know, like is, is closing end of December. So I, I appreciate the effort. Um, from my side, I, I thought it, it could be interesting to, um, um, for us to discuss this topic on the, why the majority of the data science projects, um, they, they never make it to production. Um, as, as we know, um, the concept of AI is not longer like the new next thing. You know, we've been talking um, and working with um, data in AI, machine learning for quite a while. But um, I think it's interesting that, um, of course, because of the sake of the time, we, we cannot get um, that much into detail for every single thing. But, um, but to have an elevated discussion on what are the main challenges that, that companies are facing, that they are preventing um, to be like fully successful with, with these projects. Um, Yes, a bit of, of an introduction to, um, and Thai, you know, like already introduced myself. Um, so uh, besides my name, um, I'm from Spain. I'm currently working on, um, on Databricks. Um, Databricks is like, um, for those that you know, don't know, the data and AI company, um, the founders of, of Databricks um, uh, is the people behind on, on the, um, Spark, um, Everflow, and different also like uh, open sources contribution for the data and AI community. Um, I'm, I'm working, taking care of the team, uh, the solutions architect team for Israel, Middle East and Africa. And uh, for the past um, more than 12 years, for the past 12 years, I've been on my professional career um, involved on, on data and particularly on AI. So, so even myself, like in 2009, um, when not that many people knew about um, AI, I was working on projects on um, uh, neural networks. Um, so, so for this past like 12 years, um, in between the um, big companies like, like Samsung or Microsoft, um, also smaller ones like um, AI unicorns um, from China and now at Databricks, um, I've got to, to get um, different perspectives um, from the development side, from the consultancy side, from the delivery side, and also from, from the pre-sale side. Um, so, so I, um, today, I just want to, you know, like to share with you like my insights based on, on the, um, the experience that I have and, and like my team and, and my colleagues have on, on this. I think it's a given that we all see the value of AI at the moment. Um, here we can see that um, there is a forecast of almost four trillion um, um, dollars. Uh, in terms of the business value and market opportunity expected by, by next year. And, and I think we all see that, that, as I was saying before, it's not the next new thing. It's, it's been already here for, for a long time and it's here to stay. When, when um, we discuss this with uh, CEOs or CTOs or CIOs, um, I think it's also very clear that um, they realize the value of, of implementing and adopting AI. Um, they see that it, it, it can help them into for improve their processes, um, to um, optimize their cost, to identify new revenue streams, to um, compete against competition, to be um, in the front line of, of um, research, development, and innovation. But there is a key thing that although we see the value of AI, we see where does it fit, you know, like for us to evolve as a society, 
um, for the business to succeed, um, to serve like the new demands um, in the market, in the consumer market, um, in, in, the, in us as a society, there's still um, uh, 87% of projects that they fail when they are in production. Actually, um, this is the, the, uh, an optimistic uh, percentage. If you look, there are some um, uh, market research that they are saying that is above 90%. I, I wanna, I wanna stay and, and believe that at least there is a 13% third, a that um, they are successful. There is some, um, when we think about why this is happening, um, why um, is still tricky to get on board into the AI um, rocket space? Um, of course, here you can see that, you know, like, and, and this is like a source statement, but involves like a, a big area. Mainly, we can see that um, um, there is um, a lack of really understanding what is the end to end of the life cycle of a machine learning project. Um, there is a lack of really understanding and having the practices and the processes and the uh, platforms in place to ensure a reliability and optimal um, performance. If we see here, and, and I'm sure if you ask um, someone that is not really um, that much involved into data and AI um, on the professional side, when you ask them, uh, or even they are, when you ask them about um, a machine learning project, a machine learning solution, the first thing that people think is, is a code, a data scientist with a code is developing an algorithm, a model uh, using Python or using Scala or another programming language, doing the magic and then deploying the solution. That is at the end, of course, the ML code is a core part. But if we look at the ecosystem of uh, machine learning is very broad. And that is, you know, like failing to really realize all the different parts is one of the main reasons why, why this is not being successful. We have from the very beginning on the configuration on the IT infrastructure side. Um, also, if we move and we see the data, what is the data that we need to leverage? How we can collect data? how we can use and make that data available. Then where are we building our model? When are we actually doing the code? Is it where we have our data? Is it in a different system? Um, then, um, you know, like how we, we do the, the process management of, of that, um, how we ensure that there is a governance, how we ensure there is a security in place, um, how we are training the model, how we are serving the model and to be able to deploy and how we can monitor that model at the end. Um, within, within this um, um, ecosystem, when we can see here, the hardest part of the machine learning is mach isn't machine learning, is data. I think we all agree that the success of AI as a whole and specifically machine learning or deep learning as a subset of AI is the data, you know, it's, it's I think it's a reality um, that um, data is the food of, of AI. Um, if we look within this ecosystem, if we look a little bit more in detail um, on what is the workflow of uh, a machine learning approach, what is kind of like the life cycle we can check this approach. Um, and of course, this is summarizing, but like the key parts from the initial side that I was mentioning on the ingestion to prepare that data, to serve that data, when we are doing the future engineering, when we are training, so we are building our model, then we are training our model. Um, after we train, we need to evaluate um, what is the accuracy of, of the model. We need to deploy it. And we need you know, users to be able to consume 
this, um, one of the things that we need to have in mind is um, for any AI or machine learning project, we cannot look at it as a traditional um, software uh, project. Normally for a traditional software, when you build it and you deploy it, the cost in maintenance, um, in monitoring it, um, you still have to do it. You will have a programmatic updates. Um, but um, in um, machine learning and, um, and in AI, the components of being able to track the model, to monitor the model, and then to be able to retrain the model is what is the key. And, and the main difference that, that it creates um, a whole different level of, of approaching that. Going more in detail, I find this you know, very, very um, interesting. If you ask um, data scientists, um, where do they spend the majority of, of their time when working on an ML uh, solution? Um, in between all these options, there is a 60% um, of data scientists that they highlight that all the efforts are going towards cleaning and organizing data. And, and you know, like it's, it's um, no, I actually believe that. I actually believe that because in, although data science work with data engineers on the, on the, on the data side, they still are having the challenge of, of uh, once they identify the data, how they can make that data useful um, for their model. And now, if you ask them again, what is the least enjoyable part of the data science? Interesting enough, in the, in the task that they are investing most of their time is also the area that is you know, like not enjoyable for them. Um, and of course, I, I understand, um, even myself, I've been working in, in building R&D models for um, uh, like deep learning. Um, you just wanna focus on, on building the model and retraining the model and do a testing on the model. Why this is happening? There are different reasons. And, and, and of course, we, we um, I don't want uh, anyone to take this it's, it's as a simplistic approach. We are trying to, to identify the key areas. One of them is when we identify the, air and the data that we need to use for our uh, solution, that data can be um, a structure, can be unstructured. Sometimes it's um, in a certain data warehousing. Sometimes it's on a data lake. Sometimes it's on a, on a different databases. We find companies and enterprises that they have a lot of uh, silos. They have they don't have an unified um, way to store the data, and it's very challenging to identify and to get all the different data from all the different sources to treat that data and put it together available for the data scientists. Even once you identify that data and you do all that effort, um, if any of you have already worked on an ML project, you will see it's not just one time shot. It's not like you identify your data set that you're doing um, training your model. You really need to invest on retraining your model. Sometimes you need to go back at the source of that data that you use. And what happens if you are on a different silo, building your model, training your model, how can you track um, the data that you're using once it's been clean, is in a different probably environment? It's very difficult to do the data lineage of the data. So this is one of the challenges, and this is one, one of the reasons why they spend, even though um, they, they want to focus yes, on, on building the model and training the model, um, even once they have the data to understand the data that they were using, identify new data for training, uh, making sure the data is available for them to be used is, is very challenging. Um, 
going back into into the picture of of the the life cycle of machine learning from the beginning point of of um, getting the data and and being able to to prepare that data that we discuss is one challenge it's not only that when you are building the model in an environment that is not where you have your data source um, is you have really challenges. In this case, we can see it's very hard to reproduce experiments. As I was saying, when you build the model and you really need to retrain and repeat the experiment with new data, is when, when you don't have a consolidated and unified environment, it becomes a challenge. Um, when you want to deploy that model um, and you're using a different framework, um, you want to serve the model as a, as a web services because it's a batch model as a web service. Um, and then you want to reuse that model for a different purposes. Um, not having a consolidated approach make it very difficult. It's not consistent. It's disconnected uh, one from each other. And, and it really becomes like a challenge. Um, going back to that, um, to, to that uh, workflow. We talk about the initial part, then we talk about the middle part as well. And if we focus on the deployment of the model, imagine that we gather all the data, we're really training our model, we deploy the model. This is one of the key things that is, is different to an, an approach of a traditional software. When we deploy our model and, and um, I like um, this quote of change is the only constant in life. Um, I, I, I really agree with that. Um, when we have, when we're approaching an, an ML solution, of course, one of the assumptions that we need to make, and it makes sense to make when we are creating a model and we train a model for them to be able to do any prediction, to be able to have this intelligent side, we are making the assumption that the future data is going to be very similar to the past data and the data that we are using to train. Um, but what is the problem? That data, you know, it has like a life and an entity. Data is in constant change. Um, when you have a model, it's, it's not an static environment that you deploy it and you just maintain it on, on um, schedule uh, updates. The environment that is being used, it change. The databases, um, it change. They can be, um, they can increase in quantity, they can change in, in terms of um, um, uh, different assets. Um, an ecosystem in a company um, can be using a new platform. We can now have um, new sources of data that is going to affect um, our model as well. And it's more than, than it happens on a, on, a, on a traditional software. How we call that and that model that we change, um, we, we, we value and we evaluate a model on their um, accuracy power. Of course, we want to aim a fund when we have a model, um, the most accurate one and the one that really serves our purpose is the key one, is the ideal. The accuracy and the ability to predict for a model changes over time and it gets deprecated over time. That is a fact. Um, it's not me saying it, it is happening, even though if you think that you are considering um, all the variables at the moment, the future ones, it is a fact that the model will be, um, um, will be losing the predictive power. This is what is called in the, um, in the data science world as model drifting. This is, I, I have seen that in pretty much all the projects that they are already in production and then they were successful. There is almost always a time where you see your model drifting. When we talk about model drifting, and um, without getting too much into detail, there are two things that they always get highlighted. One is the concept drift, and the other one is the data drift. 
just to put an example in, in you know, like what could be the difference or like a real life scenario of this model drifting. Imagine that we have um, um, a solution for um, um, fraud prevention. We have a solution, then when we get a phishing email, um, it gets highlighted as a potential threat for us. We've trained that model and it's working fine. After two years, the trend and the hackers change the templates, change the way that they do that phishing. They change the look and feel um, of um, how they are trying to, to, um, to commit fraud. Our model is no longer valid. It's valid in our assumptions that we we're making before. But in the initial variables, the input is changing, life change. That will be um, uh, um, that will be an um, example of concept drift. On data drift, um, one of the scenarios that I, I you know, actually I've, I've seen it very recently. When we think about a customer behavior um, uh, solution, when we want to identify the spending um, patterns of customers, normally um, for retail um, and hospitality as well, there are a lot of variables. We can consider the weather. Of course, when there is sunny weather, um, people tend to go out, they tend to spend. Um, when there is a holiday, people have time to travel and go on vacation. If you're evaluating that on a um, holiday um, region um, and a seasonal region, you will see that probably like in summer, you're expecting more people. In Christmas, you probably are spending, you're probably expecting more people um, on the ski resorts. That can be um, easy to, to address and define the model. What has been happening recently, like over the past two years or year and a half, there is a variable that is, hasn't been really, it, the model was not ready to take that into account and is the economical situation of the country and as the world as a whole. Um, there is a healthcare um, alert, there is a pandemic happening that has really affected and prevent people from traveling in summer, for example. And the moment that lockdown has been lifted and people has have the ability to take a plane, has taken the opportunity to travel. And maybe that travel is not aligned to any holiday. It's not aligned to any summer or winter period. When you're using the same model, it's, 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 it's not going to really predict it because it's not taking that into consideration. So that is um, an, an example of data drift in this case. So long story short, there is um, quite a bit of challenges when we work on, on ML. Here you can see um, kind of a holistic view of all the different uh, steps toward building um, an ML solution, taking from the raw data, you do ETL, um, you're building your model, you're training your model, you're serving your model, and you are monitoring. That part is the part that is key to identify model drifting, for example. You need to be able to identify when your model is really not serving your purpose. You need to be able to monitor that. You need to be able to validate it. And you need to have the tools to retrain that model. If we are working on silos um, and we are not paying attention on monitoring and tracking, the end user is, is not going to be aware that model is, is not non valid. So the purpose of to be able to escape to be able to be agile is, is, is not valid here. And as you can see, it's not just a linear thing. When you monitor, you identify, you go back to retraining, you identify like new data, building retraining. Also, not only for model drifting, how can companies scale and, and really have a return on investment on, on the, um, their AI journey? we could have the ability to reuse models. 
but to reuse a model, you need to identify where is the new data, where that data is, how you can retrain it. So there needs to be a constant refeeding on the whole ML lifecycle. Also, as we were discussing before, not just this, there needs to be a governance, there needs to be some permits, there needs to be security. How do you manage your ML? Um, how you can tune it? Um, without getting too much into detail, you could say that is it has their challenges on its own and we cannot treat it as a traditional um, software. Yes, as a key takeaways, okay, we understand there is a challenge. We understand there is a challenge on the data side, on the part of, of um, you know, like um, building, preparing the model, breaking the silos, deploying the model and um, monitoring the model and start from the beginning again. We see the importance of adopting um, ML, adopting ML practices and adopting ML platforms that helps you control the life cycle of your ML solutions. We could see that ML is like a DevOps, MLOps is like DevOps, but for AI and machine learning. And that is partially true. This is, as we're saying, it's a set of practices to, um, um, to, for us to consolidate the work between data science, data engineers, business analysis, um, that can improve on the life cycle. And it's proven that it really has, if you see here on the, on the right side, um, the impact of, of adopting an ML of practices and, and uh, a platform for that. Um, yes, here to, to um, address a couple of things. Many people, and yes, they say MLOps, uh, same as DevOps, but for AI, true. Um, it really is based on the same principles. It's based on agile methodology as well. Um, it has the continuous integration of the, of the source control, the testing um, for the integration side, um, continuous delivery as well. But it's different because our continuous integration and continuous deployment, CI, CD, that is super popular on, on DevOps, it really has to have in mind that it's not only about our code. We need to have our data in consideration. All the data that we have validated, the schemas, the models, the ability to deploy and be able to retrain as well. And introducing a continuity um, testing, that is a new property that we don't see on, on DevOps, um, that is really the one that giving us the ability to retrain and serve and deploy the models. Yes, to um, wrap up, um, there are many um, best practices and, and, and many um, tactics to, to make sure that we can be successful. Yes, to gather a few of them. Um, of course, you know, like the obvious one, but sometimes no so obvious, we need to align the business needs to our objectives on data science. So we make sure that we understand the data that we need to use. Where are we gonna use the models? Um, understand the people that needs to be involved. We all know there is a shortage of, of professionals working on, on data engineering side, on, on data science, machine learning engineers, machine learning ops engineers. So it's, it's, it's important to identify the people and, and invest um, on that. Leaning into the cloud, um, there are many companies that they're working on ML um, locally in a local um, infrastructure, but the cost of GPUs, the cost to maintain that infrastructure and the cost of being able to um, scale through that infrastructure is very, very high. To be able to scale um, and, and as a whole on AI, in different business units and in different areas within the organization, we believe is key to, to, um, uh, to lean into the cloud. Breaking the silos um, from the data storage to um, the, the development side, also to the, to the serving side, um, be able to, to bridge that gap is, is one of the key and be able to collaborate among each other. Um, to architect with the operations in mind, the way that we architect ML solutions, we need to have that life cycle that we were discussing. 
and to invest and leverage on, on MLOps. Um, not that many companies at the moment, they see MLOps, but they rely on DevOps and just have um, a, a few different things, a few touch on, on ML. It's really important to understand what is the needs of ML ops, what is um, the difference, and how can really help us to be able to scale and, and be successful. Yes, a key takeaway, um, less than a minute. Um, since um, I currently work at Databricks um, together with Itai, um, we do have an approach um, to optimize what we discuss. Um, we in, in Databricks, we aim um, to provide an end-to-end -end approach. We are aiming to provide that, that um, unified platform. So we bridge the gap into having your data consolidated regardless of the type of data to be able to, to build your ML models um, in the same place, um, train them and um, deploy them and, and monitor them. Um, Without um, much detail, uh, we work on the cloud and we work on um, AWS, on Azure and um, GCP as well. And um, yes, here on a high level architecture um, on Azure this side, we, we integrate with uh, native service and the leverage DevOps and we leverage uh, MLflow for um, MLOps, um, open source platform that helps and, and supports the life cycle of, of machine learning projects. And with that, um, that is the end of my session. Thank you so Thank much, everyone. Maria, for that. Thank you, everyone. So uh, time for questions. Again, you can type in the chat to raise your hand. Unmute yourself, whoever feels uh, comfortable. Doesn't seem to be questions. I'm not sure if that is good or bad. Let's wait a minute. Uh, I should have read, written it down. I, I had a question mid mid uh, midst your talk. Uh, <laughs> Estelle, you want uh, Estelle, you wanted to ask something? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. I like it a lot, and I enjoy the the charla. I don't know how to say in English. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got things. Thank you very much. So, uh, one thing that I'm thinking about is. Uh, nowadays, people want to be data scientists. So I think uh, all the, as you say, the 60% or the 57% of the time is uh, struggling with data. So I want to ask you uh, how you can put in value this work and how to explain, for example, to a C-level that is necessary to uh, invest time in this uh, area and to invest time in testing because it was, I was impressed with the red box that you show in the presentation. And uh, of course, we have a few of other elements that, that intervene or, or are uh, that we have to consider in, in a project. So how we can uh, show the value of uh, other, the other areas that we, we have to develop and that's, that's some things. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your for your question. Um, I agree with you that when people think about AI or ML, they think about data science. And even on big companies, um, I actually can see um, that there is some um, uh, appetite for AI, but there is a team of one data scientist or maybe two working alone, struggling to really do the data engineering side while they do the work and while they do also like the ML engineering side. I think it's a matter of um, educating, it's a matter of, of uh, evangelizing the reality of, of a successful AI journey. Um, and, and especially when if they want to not to have one time shot, they want to um, reinvest and leverage their investment and the ROI, it's important to, to, to understand that is not just block on the data science side. 
I know it can take time, but is um we can see data engineers are already on the on the IT team. Um, and also in our experience, this ML engineer uh, personas that we have talked about, that is still very new. In my experience, is the, the, the to do the transition from data engineer to ML engineer, it can be feasible. To build that capabilities as an ML engineer and to be able to uh, make sure that it can be deployed, it can be maintained, is in charge of the ML of practice, it can be feasible and is less of, um, of enablement than a pure data scientist. So I think it's a matter to, to coming back and, and to sum up the, the answer to, um, to really get visibility on, on the complexity and especially um, if companies want to scale, I want to leverage their investment and not just build a chatbot and call it um, the Embrace AI and that it will be done because realistically, how many people are really finding a chatbot useful? Um, so to really um, adopt AI to serve a purpose, um, the, the part of having the right data and identifying the data and work with the data and serve that data to the data engineer and the data science, sorry, is, is key. Thank you, Maria. No problem. I remember my question, but I think Dominique, uh, you wanted to ask something? Oh no. Okay, I thought she, uh, he or she unmuted himself. So I'll, I'll ask my question. So, yeah, it's, it, oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, it was by mistake, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, Maria, I, I really, um, I don't know if we can say like about pandemic because uh, obviously it's not the case, but um, uh, I think uh, the, the example with the pandemic and the data drift was very good. Can you please reiterate on the concept drift? Yes, on the concept drift is um, when we are, um, I think I was talking about the um, fraud detection on that example, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, most of the times when we are building a model and we are identifying the data, to consider to build our model. First of all, as I was mentioning, we, we have to come with assumption that the data that we use to train is gonna be very similar, that real life and a real life data. That's why we train the model, we give them like the AI, and then we can test the accuracy. But sometimes um, there is a concept drifting can be, um, can be also called as a change between the input variables and the output. It means that within time, things can change. The, um, the assets of our data, the type of our data can change. So it's the, the data that we were considering um, to help predict and identify, uh, it can change. It's not that we have other type of data is the data change itself. That's why I was explaining that on the on phishing emails, um, you have the email is coming in the same way that is text, but the different, there is different words, there is a different approach for a hacker that it was not considered. That template and that approach was not considered to detect a uh, fraud. So mm. our is not gonna be able to identify that as a fraud. It's not that we need to consider new data. It's the data that we were consider initially change. So the, the um, properties of initial data, input data, change. I don't know if it's um, yeah. uh, like more clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Many people, you will see that many people just say model drifting as a whole. You know, like the approach, regardless of there is a change that make the model not being um, um, uh, successful to, to predict, whether that is concept drifting or data drifting. And there are tools on the data science side and there are tests to prevent model drifting to a point. But the key is to monitor the, the, uh, how to detect model drifting is gonna be on the end user at the end. 
Um, and sometimes the end user doesn't know how that model was built, doesn't know the key, um, uh, what are the key considerations for the model to be built. They just know the model is not good. So internally, to be able to monitor and validate that um, over time is what is going to help us to approach that. And believe me, like model drifting is is the most common um, problem uh, happening in, um, in in machine learning world. I hope I make it a little bit clear. Yep. Take one there. Oh, Amos is, is recommending reading Black, Black Swan by Nassim Taleb to get more insight to model drifting. Okay, thanks Amos for that. Thank you Amos, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks so much Maria and uh, Thank you, Inav, and thanks, Esther, for uh, joining us today. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, closing notes. <clears throat> so uh, as Esther was mentioning earlier, uh, we have uh, over 40 chapters and over 17,000 members worldwide in this program. And again, the, the goal is to inspire, connect, draw, and champion the success of women in the big data analytics field. So as you've seen today, so it's not just big data analytics, also AI, machine learning, uh, data analysts, etc. And everyone can join regardless of gender. So just uh, go to the Women in Big Data website um, and there's a list of chapters and uh, ways to reach out to them. And <clears throat> specifically with regards to our uh, uh, Israel in Madrid chapter. So the Israeli chapter can be reached in the meetup group uh, in the uh, YouTube channel and in our email. And uh, for the Spain Madrid chapter, there's a LinkedIn group you can join. So uh, we will also share the slides later so you can easily find the links, but we encourage you to join them and interact with us. And that's it for, uh, for today. And thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we wish you a uh, nice uh, rest of the week and uh, great uh, holidays wherever you are in uh, in EMEA or in the world. And uh, yeah, have a, have a nice evening, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.